Okay, so welcome everybody. Today we're doing Train the Advocate 106. Um, so this is harnessing the impact of our community engagement team. I'm Angela, I'm the state's advocate, advocacy director. Um, and with me today is Osha Towers, um, and they are the LGBTQ engagement director and Zena Regis, who is the director of faith engagement and priority populations. Um, so again, if you haven't been to Train the Advocate, what this is just designed to set up as a Zoom meeting. We'll go through the presentation and then you can feel free to ask questions. Um, you're welcome to take any, we'll send the slideshow out afterwards and you're welcome to use the slides and presentations if you wanna do them in your community. But this is just an opportunity for us to get together, to learn more about the work that Compassion and Choices does. I'm interested in seeing the presentation. Um, because while we work with the community engagement team, they're a different department. So I'm excited to see this. Uh, next slide. And then just a few tips. So during the presentation, please keep yourself muted and silence your cell phones. We will have time for question and answer. And this presentation is for general information. So if you have any specific questions about personal situations, um, we can connect you with an end of life consultant afterwards. Next. And then group agreements, um, so use I statements, speak from your point of view, life happens, but try to minimize distractions and build upon, try not to repeat, move up and move back, so allow equal airtime. And then feel free also to go ahead and write um, questions or comments in the chat. You can also write your name and where you're from so that you know the other supporters and volunteers know who's on this Zoom meeting with us. Um, I live in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and so we always, whenever we start off our presentations, um, we start with our mission statement, which is on the screen right now. So Compassion and Choices is the nation's largest, oldest, and most active nonprofit that is working to improve care, expand options, and empower everyone to chart their end of life journey. Um, so again, this is our mission statement. And we believe in patient-directed care where patients are provided information and educated about their care and about options available so that they can make informed decisions along with their healthcare provider. And next. And now I'm excited to hand it over to Zena and Osha. Wonderful, thank you so much. I am always so excited to come to these Train the Advocate trainings. Um, I'm Zena Regis, as Angela said, I am the Director of Priority Populations and Faith Engagement. And prior to my work for um, Compassion Choices, I worked as a hospice chaplain and bereavement coordinator for about a decade in the Atlanta area where I live. And so I am just so grateful to be in this role where I get to um, marry so many of my interests. Like I didn't even know a role like this existed and then I get to be here. So I'm glad to be here with you all. And hi, everybody. My name is Osha Towers. My pronouns are they, them. I'm based in San Diego, California, but I work nationally as the LGBTQ plus engagement director. And similar to Zena, I also really was doing a lot of work within LGBTQ health before this and I started doing more training around end of life doula care work. And then was able to find this job when I went looking after being able to have more of that experience. And I'm like, wow, look at the world coming together <laughs> to make this happen. So I'm incredibly excited to be able to be here. And as we go through this presentation, you'll be able to learn more about the specific groups that Zena and I work with then. Um, but we're just excited to take you through all of the work that community engagement is doing. Mm -mm. And here's just a cute little taste of all the different activities that we do across the country to give you a sense about community engagement. We are a branch of Compassion and Choices that focuses on uplifting our African-American population, our LGBTQ work, our faith work, our Latinx population, as well as our AANHPI groups and our folks that are living with disabilities. And as well as outside of that, really making sure that everyone within our community is feeling seen and their end of life care wishes. And as we move forward through this presentation, 
We will be talking through why we do what we do. Why is this work really so important? How we do this work? So how are we able to show up in communities, make sure that we're building a relationship so they feel a sense of safety and connection to this work and see themselves being represented? And then lastly, really thinking, what does it look like for you all to really be involved within this side of the movement? So as we start today, I want each of you to think about what invigorates you in this work? Like what drove you to becoming a part of the community um, and the compassion and choices world? And what interest and talents and experience you hone in on that can allow you to find different spaces within this work to be an advocate and a supporter and new and different ways within the community engagement world. And just to give you an idea too, when I say that we are all across the country, I really mean it. This is just a glance at a few of the different programs that we are doing across the states. And then what's not included here is also all the different work that we are doing across islands, including Hawaii um, and Puerto Rico. And one thing that you'll notice as we move forward is that a lot of the work that community engagement does is really thinking about what it means to talk through advanced care planning that includes options, but is more expansive than necessarily focusing solely on medical aid and dying. And what I mean when I say that is that a lot of times in what Zena will share more about, we are really making sure that people know this is all of your options, but even if certain things are more interesting for you within your values than other things, we want to make sure that you're fully informed and are really being able to sit down and think about what are your wishes, whether that's being able to be seen represented in your funeral home care or in your burial care or within certain options around health care and really being able to make sure that people feel as though they're also represented with their culture and belief systems as well through all of that. So you'll see a lot of opportunities that we've been able to connect with people that again are going and thinking about medical aid and dying and also thinking further than that too. Awesome. Um, OSHA spoke to this, but I wanted to spend a little bit of time just framing community engagement. Often we'll send out, um, just as an example, but we'll send out emails about different programs we're doing. And we'll sometimes get some of our supporters um, emailing back, like, why is this necessary? Like, why do we need to separate people and do different programs for different communities? And so I just wanted to spend a little time framing that why. Um, next slide. So one of the things we really think about is that we hear the comment, everybody dies, so everybody needs the same information. But often everybody's access to the healthcare system is not the same. Um, and people do not think of um, their access in the same way. And so one of the things that I like to begin with is just talking about the history of mistrust in healthcare. Um, so many of the communities that we work with have faced discrimination, judgment, and refusal to treat. Um, as well as medical exploitation and experimentation. Um, I'm headed to another conference in a couple of weeks that's all about, um, that has a lot to do with reproductive justice in faith communities. And one of the things that they are talking about is just the history of um, Black women, especially enslaved Black women being ex experimented on without their consent. Um, we have J. Marion Sims, who's called the father of gynecology, who perfected a lot of gynecological surgeries on African-American enslaved women. And so that history just does not just go away. There's also a lot of misinformation um, and lack of information about what, what exists in end-of-life care and um, how do we access it? There are also significant barriers to accessing end-of-life care. We also have abuses of power that are in our in the medical system that um, a lot of people um, can just speak to. And then we have like a lack of access to insurance and facilities and treatments and not even, and then just generational lingering and lingering trauma when it comes to how people interact with the healthcare system. I saw this a lot in my work in hospice care. Um, 
often one of the things we talk about a lot is just the um, the disparity in in across communities of people who choose hospice care. And I remember talking to a patient um, years ago, um, and he was like, "I'm so excited. I mean, I'm I'm happy to have access to this hospice care, but one of the things that I wish is that I had had access." to good care when I was going through my cancer journey. Um, and because of all of the things we've talked about, um, he did it. And so we're also um, we're also dealing just with that, like people who have been harmed by the healthcare system. Um, and sometimes in our world, we really look at um, kind of like a good death is a death where we um, are not hooked to machines, where, where we're not in the hospital and all of that. But in a lot of the communities, we work in, one of the things we hear is that you did not do everything you could to make sure that I beat this illness. So I want you to do everything that you can at the end of my life so that my family knows that I'm fighting. Um, and that I'm, you're not just not doing all these things because I don't have money or I don't have insurance. So it's a lot of the things that we talk about when we get, when we are talking about mistrust. Next slide. And we talk about mistrust, um, and I love this quote about um, about the language of uh, language matters. Um, Osha, can we go to slide eleven? Yeah, um, um, the screen just completely locked me for a second there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Whoa, what's happening?" Okay, <laughs> we're back to the. Oh, here we go. Um. I love this quote um, by Dr. Ashing that says the term mistrust is victim blaming. It puts it on the community when the community has been let down by the medical system and by providers who continue to discriminate. And so I, I framed it as mistrust, but then I love to go back and think about this language of like, it is victim blaming. Like, why is this mistrust there? And so a lot of the work we do on the community engagement side is just grappling with that very well-founded mistrust. It doesn't come from nowhere. It comes from all of the things that we talked about. Um, next slide. And so we really think that transformation starts with awareness. And so just talking about all these issues and being able to name them in our conversations are so is so powerful. I'm talking about health equity. Like this is our vision is that everyone has fair and just opportunity to attain their highest level of health. And that's that starts before the end of life. Like that's what we wanna see. Health disparities, um, preventable differences in health uh, linked to social and demographic factors. Like there are significant health disparities. And so we never want, want to be an organization or a movement that ignores those significant health disparities. Also in equities, those are avoidable systemic barriers. Um, and implicit bias, attitudes and stereotypes that unconsciously affect behaviors and decisions. Um, one of the things that I write about a lot and talk about a lot is kind of how in the hospice, I, spending time in the hospice care system, it is beautiful. And I love, I want everyone to have access to hospice. But one of the things I noticed in my work there is that hospice workers can believe their own hype in the sense of like, you hear all the time, you're an angel for doing this work, or I could never, ever do the work that you do. And so often I've worked with so many hospice workers who are like, we don't need to be concerned with health equity and health disparities and equities because we are just helping people have a good death or all that matters at the end of life is compassion and love. And it's kind of yes, and those things matter, but also it matters that care is done with all of these things in mind at the from the beginning of life to the end of life. And so um, having I, a good part of our work is also making sure that people, and I often say that you cannot care about someone having a good death if you don't care about them also having a good life. Um, and so that is so much of the work that we are doing. Next slide. And so, Kind of all that to wrap up is what the community engagement team talks about a lot and thinks about a lot is that one size does not fit all. Equality 
is everyone gets the same, regardless of if it's needed or right for them. And we really wanna look in an equity framework where everyone gets what they need, understanding the barriers, the circumstances and the conditions um, that of, of the situation. And so I love this image of like, what does, what does crossing the street look like um, in the sense of equality and equity? And so the work and the large framework of our community engagement work is equity. All right, and, and so uh, we're and we're going to go through in depth um, community engagement work, but that's who we are. We lead the outreach to priority populations, including African Americans, Latinos, LGBTQ plus faith communities, AANHPI communities, and disability advocates. And we do it in so many ways um, through our leadership councils, through presenting at conferences. We really try to create materials to share in the community that look and represent a community's values and perspectives. Uh, we also produce videos featuring community members and their stories. Um, it's very important in so many of our communities to, for people to see people that look like them and represent the struggles that they um, have gone through. And so we do a lot of that work. We work with lots of volunteers and grassroots advocates. And we also have lots of partnerships with community organizations. One of the things we think is really important is not to reinvent the wheel. Um, we have, we already partner with, we partner with organizations who are already doing amazing work in this, in these communities. Um, and so that we can work with them and make sure that what we're doing meets the right notes and re meets the mark. Beautiful. Thank you, Zena. And I really just appreciate that part too about how having a good death, we need to also be able to focus on what does it mean for folks to also be able to have a good life. And I feel like across the board, a lot of our work is really centering being able to be off in community with folks and having family style meals and going to celebrations and bringing in art and music and dance and integrating all of those things into end of life conversations. So you'll see that reflected across the board when we're talking more specifically about the different populations that we work with. I oversee the LGBTQ work. Um, so I'm going to start off with what engagement within a community really looks like. <clears throat> and again, as I said, you'll see a lot of my work really being about meeting people where they're at and having conversations about the way that the LGBTQ community has been foundational in the end of life movement, given our experience with the AIDS epidemic starting and really just overall in the experiences that folks have had through navigating healthcare systems and the discrimination that we've faced and recognizing that that doesn't just automatically go away in end of life. Um, so we want to be proactive in the way that we think about our care and our planning. And I'll just share that really when I came into this work, it started from a place of seeing someone close to me lose their partner and immediately having family swoop in and take over. And these weren't people that that individual had spoken to for years. And these weren't people that were accepting of their identity, but now here they are having full access to making decisions about their body and their burial and presenting them as someone other than who they lived as and also isolating the community that they've been finding family um, and from their end of life. And I share that because in the moment that I had that experience, I thought how horrible and maybe even just guarding from myself, thinking that that was an isolated incident. But then later realizing that this is something that's repeated time and time again in our community and is a very common experience for folks. And it really just sheds light not only on the systemic issues that we have within our country, but then also on the gaps within our services and the ways that we're able to be advocates for ourselves um, and try to minimize those experiences from happening. So that's a lot of the work that I do with people is just sitting down and having stories about who do you love and your community and what really matters to you. And now, how do we talk through how can we make sure to protect those things and make sure that you're also getting the care that you want to receive surrounded with the people that you love? 
So as Zena shared, I do a lot of work with our LGBTQ Leadership Council that's represented with folks across the country, um, some folks working in healthcare, some death doulas, some folks that are educators, um, just a full spectrum of individuals really just having these conversations and connecting us to the organizations that they work with in their area. I also work with lots of different national and local partners. I'll share a little bit more about a toolkit that we worked on with SAGE, which is the country's leading LGBTQ elders group. Um, but we also do work with um, even more groups that are more focused on the legal side of things or more focused on the comfort care side of things. Or again, people that are just hosting um, pride festivals and celebrations for people because we know that historically those spaces have been about organizing and about really just having an opportunity for all of us to come together for resources as well as bonding. And you can see here that I do have a link to be able to connect to the LGBTQ webpage. And once this presentation is shared out, folks will have access to checking out the links that we have, as well as the variety of videos that we have throughout the PowerPoint. And this is just a look at some of the partners that we've been able to connect with. And again, these are people that are focused on end of life work or on community organizing work, as well as folks that are focused just around education and joy. And one of the big things that you'll see within the LGBTQ community, as well as across the board, is that we want to make sure that we're shifting our materials to really be more representative of everyone in our community. So when people come to CNC, they actually are able to see themselves and know that they're a part of this movement and know that they can trust in us to actually keep in mind what their needs are um, and what their values are. So we've done a lot of work with doing different presentations across the country and at conferences, while also having materials and videos and blog posts go out, sharing more information from our LGBTQ staff, our leadership council, and our supporters. And now we'll go into more of the guide that we were able to work on in collaboration with SAGE. And this is really all, again, about advanced care planning and the full breadth of the work. So having conversations with hospice and with caregivers and also just having moments of reflection for yourself with identifying where your values are and um, what sort of end of life you want to see, whether it's in burial or getting introduced to a death doula or making decisions around medical care. And I have just a couple of slides here that show some graphics of what's included in this toolkit, but talking on one of the big ones that I get a lot is, but who's gonna speak for me? What does it mean to have a healthcare proxy? Um, because again, when we don't make those decisions proactively, then often that defaults to next of kin, but that might not be someone that you've spoken to for many years, or it just might not be someone that you necessarily want to be speaking for your care or you want to allow them space to do their own grieving and processing or just choosing someone else that you feel as though really represents you as a strong advocate for the decisions that you want to make. So we have guides in here for thinking about healthcare proxies and then also making those conversations happen. And also just having more opportunities to be able to name more specifically the sort of care that individuals want to have and what it means to honor them. And I didn't include a slide in here with our leadership council, um, but I wanted to still include a slide with highlights of some of the amazing people that are doing this work, including individuals like David Cope, Deb Robertson, Zena Sharman, and Reverend Kevin E. Taylor. These are people that are working in religious settings, education, authors, death doulas, and just really being able to show that there is a place in this work for a full range of individuals. And I'm just really thankful and blessed by the support that we get from our volunteers and advocates that are off in the field talking to people, making these connections happen and guiding the tools that we're bringing out into the world.
And I'll save this video for folks to be able to check out um, once you get the PowerPoint. Ooh, but it looks like it's gonna start. <laughs> I'll move to you. Perfect. All right, I'll talk a little bit about our faith com community outreach work. Um, one of the things I think I talked about, like getting emails from our supporters who are sometimes when I send out faith stuff being like, it's the faith folks, it's the religious folks that are, are opposed to our movement. So why are we focused on the faith community? And I just, I want there to be a new narrative because 67% of people of faith um, are supportive of end of life options, including medical aid and dying. And so a lot of our work is elevating the voices of those who are supportive and making sure that there are resources and networks and tools to really um, support, support so many who are supportive of our movement. Um, and so this is just a, a picture of our faith leader of the year. Um, we have a Dr. Paul, Reverend Dr. Paul Smith Award that we give out each year to a faith leader who's been really supportive and instrumental in our movement. And this year it was Rabbi Ariel Stone, um, who's done so much work in her community and beyond um, around medical aid and dying. Uh, next slide. These, this is just, uh, this is a very um, minimal snapshot of who we work with, but these are some of the denominations and groups that we have done programs with, workshops with, attended their workshops. So we have the Presbyterian Church USA, the Episcopal Church, United Church of Christ, Unitarian Universalists. I always love to shout out our UUs because they have been supportive from pretty much day one um, of our movement. Um, we also do, and so, Faith engagement can be a little bit of a misnomer because sometimes we do uh, a lot of our work and a lot of our most supportive um, partners are atheist and secular and are humanist. And so we have Americans United for the Separation of Church and Christ. We also do a lot of work with Black non-believers and women of color beyond belief. Um, we just, this is, we, and this is just a small, small little snapshot. Uh, next slide. We also do webinars, and so we have lots of partners that we um, are on podcasts and webinars with, just talking about our work. Wherever you want us to talk about our work, we will. Um, and so this is just a, a little snapshot of that work. Next slide. And I wanted to end, well, not end, but want, really wanted to talk about our Faith Leaders for Compassion. Um, and this is a plug, um, but we are, we have a group of faith leaders who really, first and foremost, are really, we really seek to empower faith leaders to serve their congregants as they face the end of life. Um, and we also recruit and prepare faith leaders um, to give testimonies, um, to write opinion pieces in newspapers, to speak about our issues at different conferences, to attend various faith-related conferences and association meetings to talk about these issues, and to provide education to other faith leaders on a consultation basis. Um, really, it's, we, we have found that it's integral to our movement to have engaged um, and informed faith leaders. And so a big part of my role is to just really strengthen and build this network of faith leaders who are supportive of our work and want to be a part of it. Um, and so often, and what we're what I'm working on now, y'all are getting a little sneak peek, um, is actually having a network of congregations who define themselves as compassion congregations. Um, because what we often find is that people are, especially people who are um, who, have, who are choosing to do medical aid and dying will sometimes be shunned, unfortunately, by their faith community, or let me not say shunned, they will not be supportive. And so we are really looking for a network who says, this is a completely moral and faithful choice, um, and we will be with you throughout. And so we just want people to be able to see this is a, this is a congregation that's, a, that's supportive, and also to be able to go to that congregation or faith community um, for support and also for um, for advocacy work. Um, and so um, and so that's one of the things that we are really building up this year is our, our Faith Leaders for Compassion. Next slide. And we also have our Catholics for Compassion, and that is an initiative um, 
through compassion and choices that really just um, partners and gets a network, a strong network of Catholic advocates, Catholic medical providers, Catholic lawmakers. People, it's a group of faithful Catholics who are really committed to expanding end of life options. And we created this group, actually our supporters created this group because they were saying initially, like it can be lonely to support this, this work in our faith, but we really have found to, that we have an engaged and really active network. Um, we are also in the process of creating a Jewish Leaders for Compassion group. Um, and so we really are just trying to connect all of our diverse faith com uh, communities and connect them in this work. Sweet. Thank you, Zena. And now I'll be sharing more about our African American outreach. And we are so incredibly thankful to be able to have a team of folks that have been doing this work within our Black community for a significantly long amount of time to be able to have a leadership council that is also really doing amazing, tremendous work as being their own leaders in community and um, going and leading a lot of presentations and activating people to join our mission, our movement um, by just having things like our Journey Home presentation that happened last year, which was talking through all the amazing work and what it looks like to be a member of African-American community and the specific needs that folks may have in mind when it comes to really figuring out and planning for their care. Um, so I'm really thankful that I get to share more about the amazing work. This, is, this falls under Dr. Hall, um, Dr. Elijah Hall's work. So I'm Hope I make him proud sharing out about the tremendous work that he gets to do with the community here. And really, again, this is um, the just honestly only a few of the folks that we have on our African American Leadership Council. Their team is ever growing. And you'll see lots of folks that are, again, involved through religious work leaders that are doing death doula or funeral work and individuals that are really across the spectrum, whether it's talking about financial planning or any of the other thing. And we have seen so many um, tremendous movement when it comes to not only having folks that are joining on this movement, but also having organizations that are naming themselves as being full supporters. As Zena was talking about when it comes to actually having a faith and religious setting, being able to say, hey, no, I do trust in you and I know that you are making a faithful choice and that that still means that you are a part of our congregation, our church, our religion. Um, you also wanna think about that when it comes to other communities as well. So medical aid and dying uh, might not necessarily always be everyone's top priority or something that everyone is necessarily as supportive of within the African-American community as well. Um, but also even just thinking about charting your end of life journey as a whole, we've really been thankful to be able to make the connection with different organizations where they're naming this as a priority for our community and they're excited about being able to partner on this work with Compassion and Choices. So this is just a couple of those folks that and organizations that have been able to really say that. And here's another video that I will save for y'all for later. It has our lovely Wendy on there being precious and talking about the amazing work and when it comes to end of life planning. But I will say an important part of this video is that another thing that we often hear is that Black people just don't do the planning work, you know, like we're just not as involved in this sort of care. And I also want to challenge that in the same way that Zena was sharing that that is not necessarily the case. And even what we heard earlier about the mistrust and the brutality that's happened to African-American communities historically does lead folks to not feel safe in medical settings. Um, but what's also important is that with that being said, each and every one of our communities still thinks creatively um, and thoughtfully about other ways that we still are able to honor our loved ones and end of life. So it might not 
look the exact same as everyone else, but it's still really important and meaningful to the individual and to their family and loved ones. So we see that as well within the African-American community. And um, again, Dr. Hall does an amazing job with really making sure that we have materials that are reflective of folks. I can't say enough what it means to be able to actually see yourself because why be a part of an organization or a movement that you don't feel really cares about your identity? So it is, it has been a big priority for us to make sure that people are visible and the marketing that comes out from CNC, but that we're also out there having um, ourselves be seen on panels and podcasts, through presentations, at conferences, and really making sure to give voice to our community. And that's all you, Zena. Yes. All right. I am going to talk about our Latino engagement efforts. Um, and I'm going to try to do it quickly, but they do so much that it may be hard. Um, our Latino outreach um, has been happening in wonderful ways for many years at Compassion and Choices. We can go to the next slide, slide Osha. Um, as you can see, this is just really a snapshot of the work that we are doing. Uh, Leslie Martinez and Maria Otero are both work um, in our Latino engagement program. And I really don't know when they sleep because they are all over the country um, doing amazing work. Next slide. They also have a very active uh, leadership council um, and it's a 19 person council it has advocates, physicians, CEOs, religious leaders, activists, community leaders from all over the world. And they really, as I feel like now we're, y'all have all become a part of our choir and we're now preaching to the choir, but really strategize how to do specific um, outreach and engagement to Latinos all over the country. Um, reframing what end of life choices mean, changing perceptions of hospice and palliative care, speak out at community events, write letters and, and uh, to editors, opinion pieces. Um, it's a very, very active council who does amazing work. Next slide. And this is next is just pictures of some of the faces on the council um, who are just very active. Uh, this is another video, but it will be in the slide so you can watch it. And Jorge has an amazing story, a very touching story. And so please watch it if you get the opportunity to. One of the really important things that um, so much of the work that, um, that our Latino engagement team does is important. But um, one of the things that um, they have focused on is translations, making sure that all of our materials are translated um, into Spanish and, and that they are faithful, um, faithful, accurate translations. Um, we often hear um, from Maria, Maria and Leslie, like you can translate things, but it won't get to the heart, to the spirit of what needs to be communicated, especially when you are translating such sensitive uh, materials. And so we are really working on making sure that all of our resources are in Spanish and in English, um, but this is just um, a snapshot of some of those. Um, and most of them are available on our website, but our translation work is something that's ongoing um, and very important to our movement. Next slide. Um, and then we have our Ventania de Salud program, and it is um, really innovative. Um, Compassion and Choices is partnering with VDS um, to train the trainers, to train community health workers in different communities to be end of life resources. And so our end of life materials, messages, um, resources, programs, tools are coming from people within these different communities who have been trained by Maria and Leslie um, to really make sure this information is disse disseminated in, um, in just the best way possible that resonates in the community. Um, VDS does so many trainings. I think it, it may be over 10 now. This might be an, over uh, um, an older slide, um, but there are several VDS sites across the US. Um, there are trainings that are happening all the time. Um, and there are libraries across the country that has our materials partnered with VDS to make sure that the communities that need them receive them. 
Um, and then our next slide is just a little, is just a snapshot of some of the Latino organizations that we are partnering with. Um, as we talked about, partnering with community organizations is such an important part of our work. And Leslie and Maria do such a wonderful job of making sure that our, um, our messages are all over Latino media um, and just all over these different organizations. So yeah, now we're going to get into our AANHPI, so thinking about our Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities. And then we're nearing the end here, so if there are any questions, just being able to think about those as we'll have time for that um, coming up for you. So really being able to think about the ways that, again, we're making sure to represent our community. And one of the biggest things that you'll see within this work is really making a point to, like I said earlier, think more creatively through having our work integrated into arts and music. Um, you'll see us even at parades and um, celebrations for folks where we're having these deeper conversations about end of life, but it's done in a way that is still um, inviting and connected to causes that really matter to folks and through a medium that actually aligns more so with people's interests. So you'll see a lot of tremendous work coming out of our team in that way. We also have a lovely leadership council um, and we have folks that have been incredibly involved, whether it's through being individuals within the medical world or folks working in legal teams um, and folks that are also just helping to really be a guide on making sure that we're just even doing a better job in the way that we're really being able to connect with individuals across our communities and showing up even more within our A and HPI groups. Yes, um, and our our final community that we're going to talk about is our disability community outreach. Um, we have a group that is called, uh, we can go to the next slide, um, Us for Autonomy, um, and really focusing on the issues of autonomy, independence, and self-determination um, in communities um, and our disability rights, in the disability rights movement. And so really looking at how we expand into life care, care options and the disability rights movement um, together um, and our shared values of autonomy and independence and self-determination. We'll go to the next slide. And Us for Autonomy is our initiative um, within Compassion and Choices to affirm autonomy and self-determination of people with disabilities to choose end-of-life care that meets our needs, priorities, and values. And one of the things, um, I actually have a faith leader who's on our Faith Leaders Council and also a very active um, on us for aut autonomy. And we were discussing this and she said, I don't ever want to have less rights because I have a disability. Um, and so that is part of why she is very active in this movement. But we really are in this work, bringing our grassroots advocates together um, to advance equitable access for high quality end of life health care for everyone. Um, and so we just think this is such an important initiative and we are thankful for all of our leaders and supporters and activists who support us in this work and who are really leading this work. And that really brings us back to that question that I asked of you all earlier in the presentation. And that's just to think about what brings you to this movement and what interests, talents, experience you all have that are ways to be thinking more creatively around what are you already doing? And also what more do you see yourself maybe interested in being able to participate in or share out about given all the different things that you were able to see throughout this presentation today? Maybe being a storyteller is something that really speaks to you and sharing more about your loved ones, your diagnosis, your experience, and being able to move people in that way. Maybe it's more so about helping with all these different amazing tools and resources that we have coming out into community and really making sure that those are drafted in a way that connects to people and is real for folks. Maybe you're somebody that has amazing experience with writing articles and connecting to news outlets, and that's something that really means a lot to you. 
And also maybe you're someone that's really passionate about the legislative side of this work and interested in being able to be an advocate and advancing end of life care for folks across the country. So whatever that looks like, I hope that something stood out to you in this presentation today and that you're able to just learn more about the work that our teams are doing. And maybe there are some thoughts that you have. Um, so please feel free to always reach out and connect with us because that, as Zena said, is a huge part of the work that we do, which is really just trying to not always recreate the wheel, but just make sure that we're connecting with individuals in the way that is the most meaningful. So thank you so much um, to Angela for bringing us on today and for you all for just making space for us to be able to share out some more with you. Thank you. I just have a couple more updates. So next slide. Oh. <laughs> Uh, so just a reminder, Compassion and Choices is funded almost exclusively by individual donors like you. Um, so if you have, um, I always say you can volunteer your time, or if you have, you know, any amount will help us continue our mission. So please consider making a donation today. And next slide. And then I just want to point out, we have some upcoming trainings. Um, so Train the Advocate 101, I'm going to be redoing some that I did earlier this year, but I know we get new um, supporters and sometimes people can't make other ones. Um, so we're going to be doing Train the Advocate 101, Overview of Compassion and Choices and End of Life Options on May 21st. Um, we'll be doing Train the Advocate 102, Dementia Values and Priority Tools. And then I just sent in the information to become an event um this morning but just that we're going to do a train the advocate 107 intro to medical aid and dying on june 25th at 3 p.m and that's going to be eastern time um so i'll make sure that um the event link goes out with the follow-up email and uh, next slide and then some trainings that i'm not doing but just webinars um osha i believe you are lead on this one. So your healthcare decision, or no, um, you're doing the end of life advocacy change makers, why we volunteer with compassion and choices. Um, but your healthcare decisions exploring the dementia directive, um, that's going to be very similar to the train the advocate one or two dementia one I'm doing. Um, Jessica is our national director for clinical engagement, and she's going to be joining both of them. So the one um, on the 23rd is a webinar um, where she's just going to be going through the tool and then the one on June 21st um, that's a train the advocate will be set up like this meeting. So you'll be able to ask questions directly to her um, at the end. And then also and there's a note. Oh, did someone say something? No. Um, and then a noticing joy and grief um, with Kimberly Pittman Schultz is going to be on May 8th. And then that is it. You can stop sharing your sc your screen, Osha, and then we can have some time for questions or comments. Yeah, any thoughts? I can start with one um, that I just think, oh, Osha, I think you maybe called me night like a little naive. Was that <laughs> in a loving way when we? Because I was just saying, like, I just didn't realize, like, growing up, um, not until I got older in college, because everybody I went to school with was a, kind of like a white middle class person. And my dad's a social worker and my mom's a nurse. So it was always just treat everybody the same. And so there are things that I just still don't get. And I was recently on a palliative care um, webinar and it was on, it was put on by, I think, the um the national group that's trying to advance palliative care and it was on the lgbt plus community and so it was myself and then a bunch of palliative care nurses and they were just talking about like ways that you um you know to be more inclusive and respectful to the lgbt community if they're in the emergency room um and facing the end of life and a lot of it just seemed like, duh, like, of course you would do that. Kind of similar to that story that you shared, um, where like, I would assume that you would recognize the chosen family and allow those people into the hospital and to be there, you know, and, to, you know, hopefully there's some advanced directives where you have a healthcare proxy where someone's making that choice, um, but was blown away in the comments from the other palliative care nurses 
saying like how wonderful the webinar was and how they hear stuff like this day in and day out in the nurse or in the EDs where other staff were being disrespectful towards the LGBT community. And it like, they were saying what a great webinar was and I left feeling like super sad. Um, so, but that, you know, goes on. Like I know it goes on, but to like hear about it and that it's happening so much, um, it was really upsetting. And the other thing too, is we have a slide that talks about how African-Americans receive um, less pain medication and more aggressive treatment at the end of life. And when I've been with Compassion and Choices for two years, and this wasn't, end of life was not my specialty necessarily. Like I knew a little bit about it, but not when I started. And, um, you know, it's like you can make these assumptions on why you think it might, you know, this might be like, maybe they're not receiving the education or different cultures talk about death or not even call it death. Um, I have a friend who's Navajo and they don't even ever acknowledge it really coming. Um, I've learned more to talk about traditions that you want in the Navajo culture rather than talking about advanced care planning and caregiving. But, um, you know, so when I had heard too that it was because that one of the reasons that might be is because throughout life they have not been given care. Um, and I was re recently watching or reading an article about organ donation up until just like this past year, um, there was some like totally outdated um, like statistics that they were using that were saying that black people had more muscle in their organs and so that they didn't need to, um, their organs would last longer than like a white person's. And so for that reason, they were, on waiting lists much longer and less likely to receive organ donations, even though that's not true. Um, and so they just came up and told um, the National Organ Donation Center that they have to go back and reevaluate this and rearrange things. And this just happened, you know, like the, as of last year. Um, so this, it's not like it, this is so far in this history. But so when you think of it in those terms of like not getting the care that you that you see other people getting around you and then you're at the end of life and people are like, well, you don't have to go on a breathing machine or you don't have to get a feeding tube. And you're thinking, do I not have to, or am I this being withheld for me again? Um, so I just think, you know, that was just really eye opening to me and how I think I approach things and conversations with different people. So I really appreciate the work that community engagement has been doing. Thank you so much, Angela, for everything that you shared. And I absolutely do agree to you that I think one of the things that really stands out to me about that is um, that we're, we're all being able to just have experiences of learning more and there is no expectation to know absolutely everything coming into this. So that's why, you know, we're here to talk through more of this and talk about how we actually are able to show up for individual individuals and even what you were saying too about the way that we talk through um community is saying death versus passing versus um some folks that aren't necessarily in a place of thinking about the paperwork of advanced care planning but are absolutely interested in talking about the ceremony and ritual um and setting the scene for a transitional moment um so so yeah i'm still processing the organ donation bit though i did not hear that i thought you were going to talk about lgbtq folks and um donating and like blood and things like that and how that's also recently been lifted um but but yeah it's it's horrifying and in my last job i did a lot of work with training um healthcare professionals and so often people would just be like no, <laughs> I don't want to serve LGBTQ folks. Um, and then that's like its own whole conversation about really breaking that down and recognizing, you know, the job that you have. So, so thank you for being able to share more about that. And again, just for being able to bring us on. Yeah, same here. Um, I'm so grateful for this conversation and I'm grateful for our supporters um, and all of you who are here who just do so much in this work and even beyond the like, the of course egregious ways that we talk about um, that people are discriminated and we see health disparities and health inequities. There's also the little 
not tiny, but there are little ways that, that really make a difference. Working in hospice, I would see different patients and the way they were described often as uh, non-compliant or difficult or um, drug seeking. And you look at it and, and if another patient of a different um, demographic or group did the same behavior, they just did not get the same label. Um, and so it's really important, even those ways, because those those charts and those descriptors follows, follow our patients throughout their lives to end of life. Um, and so I would find myself as a hospice chaplain, just really dismantling those labels with the team um, and really talking about like what they mean and why are we so quick to label certain groups versus others. Um, and so even that, even that little awareness of like, why am I using this language um, can be really powerful. And, and even um, I went to the, the Association for Death, Death for Death Education and Counseling, um, last week, and I gave a presentation on spiritual care and medical aid and dying, but I saw one workshop that was about Black grief, um, especially grief at death. And one of the presenters talked about how often security is called in hospitals when Black families are grieving, even though when she's seen certain, when she's like, the same behavior happens in every family when there's an unexpected or, you know, a sudden death. Um, but often security is called and she was like, talking about how like that just sends a message um, to a lot of these families that their grief is like their grief cannot be in a public space. Um, and so she was telling people like telling professionals to that you can be that change. You can be the voice to advocate and say, why are we calling security? Like there's nothing happening. There's no danger. Um, this is just a family that's grieving. And so it's things like that. Um, that make us realize that why so many of our communities do not feel safe in healthcare settings.